Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Leadnap Gaming. Today we're going to be doing a review of the Thrustmaster Warthog Hands-On Throttle and Stick. We have arrived in a perfect storm of non-availability. Reeling from pandemic logistical issues coupled with stay-at-home demand, and the release of multiple big-name games that call for hands-on throttle and stick for the best immersion. As such, flight simmers and space pilots alike have watched in horror as prices have skyrocketed on even basic kits like the X-56 or TM-16000. Which makes reviews like this one that much more important. The Thrustmaster Warthog was never inexpensive, at an MSRP of around $500, which has now climbed between $750 and $850. While still not win-wing expensive, these prices place the Warthog into the premium market. But are you getting a premium kit? There are plenty of reviews to choose from, but most are based on first impressions, in collections of kits, and usually paid for. I have been using this Warthog setup for over a year now, exclusively. I didn't pay full price for mine either, because I bought it used from a virtual squadron mate. This of course means that mine is not a stock configuration, but that's a good thing. Let's get started with the stick. This is an update of the earlier Thrustmaster Cougar, and it represents everything I love about the current generation of Thrustmaster products. The buttons are not too hard with a noticeable but not obtrusive break. The hats are crisp with noticeable groove to travel inside. You never wonder if you're sending the wrong commands. Unlike the market segment below this one, the Warthog stick offers a two-stage trigger as well. The stick itself is made of metal. It's heavy. This whole kit is heavy. This is a one-to-one -one replica, upsizing slightly from the Cougar and refining a number of elements. The stick sits on a ball mount, which has considerable friction. I found this a major upgrade from the system used on the X-56. It feels like you're actually flying something with some weight. This of course is a personal preference. I did notice that when flying the F-16, I have to use a lot of stick input, which results in a different feel to the jet. On the X-56, every movement in the Viper was snappy. Small stick adjustments turned into big changes, which made small flight adjustments difficult. On the Warthog stick, this was the opposite. Big flight control changes require big stick changes, but that means finite small adjustments are very easy to do. There's no control zone, the stick is smooth to operate throughout its range. Something like the F-16, which has a force sensing stick in real life, translates somewhat funny as a result. Flying the F-A-18 Hornet on the X-56 in TM-16000 wasn't anything to write home about. On the Warthog stick, it was like butter. Everything felt just right, and that translated to the Viggen as well. If you're flying a conventional flight control module in DCS, this stick will feel like a natural extension of your body. For Space Sims on the other hand, just like the Viper, it just doesn't feel just right. Nothing to complain about, but at times, I felt like I was fighting the stick's tension to make maneuvers. You'll get used to it, and it takes nothing away. I just felt like the X-56 maybe did it better. Again though, that all boils down to personal preference. For the F-A-18 guys out there, Thrustmaster does make a Hornet grip that will be properly configured control-wise for everything you're looking for. As I mentioned earlier, I got this kit used, and altogether this kit has roughly three years of hard use under its belt. I mention this as a good thing, because I can report on the sturdiness of the kit. The only place wear and tear has appeared is in the countermeasure hat on the side of the stick. The forward input has worn out slightly, requiring a push forward and down to achieve input, because that's a heavily used command on the hat. Otherwise, Everything is as crisp and operable as the day it left the factory. While Thrustmaster improved a lot from the Cougar version of the stick, the only thing I found lacking was the mushy second detent of the trigger. The brake is at the very end of travel, meaning to activate the second stage, you have to have the trigger pulled all the way to the backstop. 
I would have preferred the detent be slightly forward, so a controlled pull could activate both rather than a hard pull back. This is generally not a problem in the way the US Air Force uses the two stages. When going for guns, a smooth pull to the rear to activate the camera and fire the gun. The stick performs to that issue. Likewise, when trying to laze, activating the first stage, no problem at all. Where I ran into difficulty was when trying to use the two-stage trigger for the Vigan, where the first stage unsafed the trigger and the second detent released weapons. Unsafing was never difficult, but the trigger doesn't like being held in the middle range with one detent down, followed later by the second stage. Eventually I just made the pickle my safety and used the first stage for weapons release, ignoring the two-stage feature altogether. These are nitpicked issues. The stick is solidly built and performs admirably, but for $500 or more, we get to nitpick. There's one last flaw in the stick that will hamper anyone not using the default desktop baseplate, which given the monster size is likely to be most of you. There's no bottom plate to the base. If you remove the base from the base plate, the wiring is exposed. If using desktop mounts, you'll be fine because they will tie into the plate for the mount. However, this didn't sit well with me. I prefer not having my wiring exposed to an external element, and I had to solve this by using some cardstock custom cut to fit inside. When I transitioned the Warthog to my sim pit, I was generally forced to retain the plate from the desktop mounts for mounting purposes. It won't affect your use of the stick, but it will certainly lead to some frustration if you decide not to go with the default desktop base plate. For $500, I expected better. On the throttle side, it's more of a mixed bag, depending on your needs and use. The throttle is heavy, heavier than you imagine. Even though I have it bolted in, there's no reason to. It's not going to move on your desktop. The switches are solid, complete with satisfying clicks. The friction adjustment works extremely well. You will be able to tailor the friction for your preference, and I'm happy to say that after years of abuse, I can still set it and forget about it. It has not changed due to use, like some cheaper throttles. I do have the slew upgrade on here, and frankly, I find this a must do. Two other features that are fantastic on this throttle are the idle input, though it doesn't work on all DCS modules due to mapping, and the option to have or not have an afterburner detent. I have an aftermarket Vigan detent installed. Swapping these out is a 10 second job, and there are dozens of aftermarket options out there. Though plenty remove this feature altogether, I like having a stop, especially when needing to get every last drop of fuel in the Viper. You feel every dollar of value in this throttle. It is magnificent, durable, well constructed. It just has two problems that define the buy no buy scenario for most users. This kit was licensed from the US Air Force. It's a replica control set for the A-10 Warthog, from which it draws its name. The throttle is a one-to-one -one replica of the A-10's dual throttle, with boat switch, hats, everything else meticulously placed. The switches on the base are not one-to-one -one by any means, but replicate a number of important controls you would want to not use the mouse for. This isn't a problem, especially considering when this was produced, Thrustmaster was also producing the Cougar, a replica of the F-16's TQS and stick. A decade ago, the market looked like there would be one-to-one -one replicas for all the popular birds, but Thrustmaster never delivered. The Warthog is the only entry in this segment that's one-to-one. -one. The Cougar is discontinued, and rather than produce a Hornet kit, the stick head can be replaced to mimic it. This is where the problems creep in. The Warthog throttle base works perfectly for DCS's A10C and A10C2. The moment you go to convert this throttle to a different module or game, you could start to see some frustration. These switches are on, off, and momentary on, which heavily restricts their use for anything other than what they were intended for originally. These switches are on off, which doesn't play nicely with a lot of mapping options that don't allow for constant input. In other terms, while some control mappings will see that the input is no longer on, and therefore turn it off, other modules see on inputs as momentary inputs, and ignore the change to off as a result. As the control uses only one input, you can turn things on, but not off if this is the mapping case. 
What this means is if you don't use this for the A10, there will likely be a number of controls you want to map, but can't, and therefore a large number of these switches you'll never use. For many, this may not be so much a flaw as it is a feature. The segment branches here, between ultra-premium offerings like Winwing, which continue the practice of dedicated switches built around specific aircraft and mappings, or the other ultra-premium offerings like those of Verpal, which are generic, offering you maximum customization. Of course, Winwing is moving in the generic direction as well. The problem I have with it is that for the price point, I shouldn't have to choose. It isn't the fault of Thrustmaster, various games map controls differently, but shelling out $500 to $850, I shouldn't need to go buy another HOTAS to play a different flight game if I want to use all the controls. And this is what really harshed my vibe. If you are upgrading from a lower segment kit, you really expect that you can repurpose the switches to work for what you need and not the A10. Admittedly, everyone's mileage may vary here. Different games and modules accept or reject various features of the throttle. In MSFS, I use five of the controls. For the F-16, nine. Vigan, seven. I didn't even bother mapping switches using only the throttle in Star Citizen. It just seems like a waste given the amazing industrial quality switches, the sturdy and sleek backlit base. Which really brings us to the important question, should you buy one? If you fly the A-10 in DCS, do not pass go. This is the last HOTAS you need buy. For everyone else, it's a little more complicated. If you fly in DCS, opting instead for the stick and stick base only option will save you a lot of money and deliver one of the best stick controls out there. There are other options that offer more customization, but they also demand a higher price. I felt like the throttle itself was a major improvement on the X-56 I had been using. Many of the things I didn't like were resolved, however, when it came to the throttle base, the X-56 was immeasurably more useful. If you're not flying the A-10, and if prices remain around $800, skip the throttle. Look instead to competitor offerings that will deliver the same quality and offer you more options to configure the system for your needs. Yes. This will cost you more money, but in the long run, it will be money well spent. If you're a space simmer, you're going too far. It may seem tempting to upgrade the quality, but the X-56, TM-16000, and VKB offerings deliver everything you need, nothing you don't. You won't find benefits in this segment for the money spent. There is, however, something to consider in today's market. As I mentioned, I got mine from a squadron mate, which saved me a lot of money. This is a fantastic reason to be part of multiplayer communities in whatever game you're playing. There's a major private secondary market that can give you a chance to upgrade while saving a ton of money. As I mentioned earlier, this particular kit has seen a lot of abuse. Not only do I use it regularly, but the individual I purchased it from used it near daily. Despite this, it's running flawlessly. Everything is solid as the day it came out of the factory. While other kits out there I would be tempted to say, just buy it new, I wouldn't worry about buying one of these second hand. They're built like a tank killer. Keep in mind, there's a big secondary market for them because, for many a serious simmer, its negatives demand spending even more money to overcome. Hardcore flight simmers still see a need to upgrade from the Warthog. This can be a terminal HOTAS for your experience. The quality is there, and if the Cougars in use today are any indication, it will last forever. That said, saving your hard-earned money and picking up kits in the segment just above, from Winwing and Verpal, are likely to leave you equally satisfied, while not worried that you have to spend money again down the road to upgrade. Buying a Thrustmaster Warthog is more a decision about small details. The quality is unquestionably there. You cannot go wrong getting your hands on one of these, but you can have buyer's remorse. Positioned above the entry-level market, and having been for the better part of a decade the best kit available, there are tons of aftermarket options to beef it up further. I used three myself. When I purchased mine, I expected to be happier, but I have been more than satisfied. 
it was an upgrade. It's incredible fun to fly with, and it does deliver the precision and control you need to participate in hardcore gaming groups. Versatility is simply the area it struggles with, while excelling everywhere else. So let me know in the comments your thoughts and experiences. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't, and I will catch you all next time.